Now, I have to tell you that the model we have just built to predict how the membrane potential changes with a current injection only works when we consider the neuron as a simple spherical shell that has a uniform voltage across its volume. Fortunately for us, this model can very well approximate what happens with current injections in a soma, but for compartments such as the dendrites and the axon, this model does not hold anymore. And we need something else to describe the behavior of the membrane potential. For example, when we consider the dendrites, the voltage following a current injection drastically differs as a function of position. As a result, voltages across the entire tree of dendrites differ at a given time, whereas the voltage at the soma stays relatively uniform. The main reason why the voltages differ in terms of position is because the charges leak out to the exterior while they are traveling in the dendrite. But we will come back to that aspect shortly. As I've pointed out before, Dendrites are often the actual sites of current injection via synapses or other sensory mechanisms, so to properly understand how voltages are impacted in dendrites, we need to create a new electric circuit model that will accommodate their difference. The structure of dendrites can be very complex, but to approximate their shape in three dimensions, we can model them as cylinders. When we consider the inside of the cylinder, the cylinder is still part of the neuron, so you can imagine it as having a phospholipid bilayer shell and the inside filled with cytoplasm. We will assume that the cylinders have a constant radius A and we will attribute a value L to the length of the cylinder. Note that the length of the cylinder is in the axial axis. To make a better approximation, we can segment the cylinder into small units of length delta X. But before we dive into the circuit, I want to take a minute to explain the terminology of the electrical components such that it doesn't get too confusing later. First, let's establish a few geometric equations. What will first be relevant for us is the area of the cross-section of the cylinder, which is simply the area of a circle, so pi times the radius square. What is also relevant for us is the area of the surface of the cylinder, and we don't need to take into account the ends of the cylinder. Hence, the surface area is simply 2 pi times the radius times the length of the cylinder. Now, regarding the actual electrical parameters, remember that our cylinder is made out of a plasma membrane, so here again, our cylinder will generate some form of capacitance by separating positive red charges from negative blue charges. If we consider the total capacitance of the cylinder, noted CT, we can determine the membrane capacitance per unit length, noted lowercase cm, by dividing the total capacitance by the length. We can also determine the membrane capacitance per unit area, also known as the specific capacitance, by dividing the capacitance per unit length by the circumference. This quantity is noted as uppercase cm. One simple relation we can already establish with our model is that if we decrease the radius of the cylinder, we decrease the size of our model dendrite, and thereby we reduce the amount of charges that the membrane can store. Hence, the capacitance is proportional to the size of the cylinder. In addition to the capacitance, remember that the membrane has channels embedded in it that allows ions to flow in and out of the cell. As such, we can establish the same quantities for the total resistance, resistance per unit length, and resistance per unit area. Here, however, it is a bit tricky because it seems like the areas are not at the correct places. This is because resistance is inversely proportional to the area, and thus increasing the area reduces the amount of resistance because with a larger membrane there are more channels that ions can take to flow out of the cell. To get the opposite relation, you can consider the conductance, which is proportional to the area. So as you increase the surface, you increase the conductance. One final property we now have to consider is the resistance due to the cytoplasm as the charges move inside the cylinder. This resistance is named the axial resistance and is noted capital RA. Similar to what happens in an electrical wire, we can define this internal resistance as the product of the resistivity of the cytoplasm times the length divided by the area of a cross-section of a cylinder. Here again, we can find the axial resistance per unit length by dividing the total resistance by the length, which leaves us with this expression. Just like the membrane resistance, 
the axial resistance is inversely proportional to the size of the cylinder. Indeed, if the cylinder is smaller, the area for the charges to flow becomes more constricted and thus makes the flow of charges harder. To have a more intuitive picture of this relation, you can imagine how the flow of water in a pipe would be influenced if the diameter of the pipe changes. In both cases, increasing the size reduces the internal resistance. Now, this is a lot of small equations and we are not going to use them all. Here are the relevant properties and equations we will need to keep in mind. You will notice right here that these are the three passive membrane properties that I have introduced a section ago. Alright, let's get started on our electric circuit model, which will take place at the membrane. The model we are about to begin describing is from cable theory. Here again, we can consider the extracellular matrix and the cytoplasm as two conductors. Contrarily to the equivalent circuit model, we need to indicate on the intracellular side the axial resistance. Now, there is a resistance that you can technically attribute to the extracellular side, and it is relevant when the extracellular space is restricted, such as in nerve fiber bundles, but we will just assume that for simplicity, our neuron is isolated and the extracellular space is pretty vast. With this assumption, the extracellular axial resistance becomes negligible. Since we are still dealing with the membrane, we need to indicate the membrane resistance and membrane capacitance, which are connected in parallel to our conductors. Remember that we have segmented our membrane in short segments of length delta x. Hence, each segment of length delta x will have its own little circuit. Also, since each component is defined as per length, we need to multiply them by the length of the slice to get an accurate value, except for the membrane resistance, which is divided because of its inverse proportionality. Now, what is missing for us to complete the circuit is to indicate the currents and the voltages of our system. To understand the currents and the voltages in this system, let's think conceptually of what happens in the cylinder when we inject a current into one region of length delta x. Assuming we are injecting positive charges inside and the resting state is negatively charged, the site where the current is injected will have the highest voltage with respect to the outside with, let's say, a value V0. Now, as the charges begin to spread out, they will have three choices for where they can go. First, the charges can continue flowing through the cytoplasm. We will name this current capital I. Another option for the charges is to leak out of the membrane through ion channels or finally they can be stored by the membrane as capacitance which both constitute a form of membrane current noted as IM. As charges continue moving in the cytoplasm, they are faced with that same decision and they ultimately leak out of the membrane through the channels which progressively decays the voltage back to a resting value. Both the current and voltage diminish as a function of time and distance. Back to our electric circuit, to make it less convoluted, let's just analyze one junction. One junction will be sufficient to derive the cable equation, but keep in mind that this pattern is repeated many, many times. So, assuming that the left circuit is at position x, we can indicate the voltage across the circuit as V of x and t. In the right circuit, the voltage will be V of x plus delta x and t. Likewise, we can indicate the currents in the same fashion. Here again, we will adjust the currents that are per unit length by multiplying them with the length. The final piece before we start discussing the cable equation is to indicate the injected current, which again is per unit length. Note that the current does not come from within the cell, but having the arrow like this will make the derivation more intuitive with regards to Kirchhoff's law. All right. We now have every component to derive the cable equation. Let's start by analyzing the voltages through the perspective of Ohm's law. The difference in voltage between the point x and x plus delta x is equal to the axial resistance times the current going through it. If we divide both sides by delta x, we arrive at a very special equation. Indeed, notice that on the right side, if we take the limit as delta x goes to infinity, we almost have the definition of the partial derivative of the voltage with respect to x. If we add a negative sign, we get the same expression which we can replace in our equation. Thus, we arrive at the relation that the rate of change in voltage with respect to position 
is equal to the negative product of the axial resistance per unit length and the current going in between. This bit of information will be very useful for us, so I will keep it close. Now, we can also analyze the currents of this system with Kirchhoff's law, which stipulates that the sum of the currents at one node equals zero. Because it is positive charges moving, remember that our convention says that positive charges moving out of the cell is positive current. And in the horizontal plane, we will assume that the right is positive. Next, we can rearrange the similar terms that are multiplied by delta x together. Here again, we can divide both sides by delta x, which gives us an expression very similar to the partial derivative of the current with respect to position if we take the limit of delta x to zero. This, as a result, gives us that the membrane current leaking out minus the injected current is equal to the negative partial derivative of our current with respect to position. Remember that the negative sign here is to adjust the definition of the derivative. The expression we have previously found comes into play. If we take a partial derivative of both sides, we can arrive at the fact that the partial derivative of the current with respect to position is equal to minus 1 over the axial resistance times the second partial derivative of voltage with respect to x. Consequently, we can replace the partial derivative of current to get this new expression. Remember from our discussion on the equivalent circuit model that the current going through this parallel system of a capacitor and a resistor is simply equal to the capacitive and resistive current, which are expressions we have already found. Since the voltage is now a function of time in position, we need to use the partial derivative and not the simple derivative. Anyhow, we can replace the membrane current by this expression, which leaves us with this. The final step in our derivation is to multiply both sides by the resistance, which gives us this final equation. To simplify it a bit, we can make two constants. First, the time constant, which we have already discussed at length in the previous section, and the second constant is the space constant denoted by lambda. The space constant is defined as the root of the membrane resistance divided by the axial resistance. This constant has units of length. Another quick note, since E is a constant and can be essentially treated as an offset, you will often see this equation without the E in order to make it simpler. In all, the equation that governs how the membrane potential changes as a function of time and space in our model cylinder is this very complicated second-order partial differential equation. Nonetheless, to get a good feeling of the equation and the space constant, we can consider a simpler scenario where we disregard time, otherwise known as the steady state scenario. In this scenario, we will have to make a few assumptions. First, we assume that the length of our cylinder is infinite. Secondly, we assume that we inject current directly in the middle of our cylinder, such that there is only a value of current I0 at the origin and everywhere else other than x equals zero has a current value of zero. Thirdly, as it says in its name, the steady state scenario disregards time and assumes a scenario where the rate of change in voltage as a function of time is equal to zero. In our context, this implies that the capacitor is fully charged. By imposing the condition that del V del T is equal to zero, our partial differential equation now simply becomes a differential equation as it only takes position in consideration. The solution for this equation when we disregard the current is the following. The membrane potential as a function of distance is equal to an initial voltage times an exponential factor that varies according to the position. Like in our discussion about the time constant, we can think of this equation as having three compartments. The blue segment of this equation is the membrane potential as a function of distance, the green is the maximal voltage that is measured at the origin, and the pink term is the decaying factor. The decaying factor in pink will decrease for all x, so as the position gets further from the origin, then so does the voltage. Let's visualize this equation by plotting it on a graph. At x equals zero, or in other words, the site of current injection, the pink term becomes one, and thus, the voltage has a maximal value of V0. As you get further from the site of injection in either direction, the value of the membrane potential is less and less impacted by the current impulse because of the leak current. When you are at a position equal to lambda, 
you are at a position where the membrane potential has decayed to 1 over E of its value, which is about 37%. Thus, the space constant gives a measure of how far the disturbance in Vm extends from the site of current injection. To see its impact more graphically, let's consider the blue curve as our reference lambda. If we were to consider a smaller lambda, you can see that the curve becomes smaller and means that the voltage has decayed faster than the reference value. On the other hand, a higher value of lambda shows that the signal decays slower from the site of injection, which means that the membrane potential can be impacted further. One interesting observation about the space constant is what factors mostly influence its value. When we look at the equation of the constant, remember that the membrane resistance per unit length is simply the membrane resistance per unit area divided by the circumference, and the axial resistance is the resistivity divided by the area of a circle. After substitution and simplification, you can see that the constant is directly proportional to the root of the radius. Thus, as the dendrite or axon gets bigger, then so does the space constant and thus the signal is better maintained in terms of position. With this being said, we have now covered the three passive membrane properties. The membrane capacitance, the membrane resistance, and the axial resistance as well as the two constants, the time constant tau and the space constant lambda. In summary, these properties affect how the magnitude of the membrane potential changes as a function of both time and distance. One final note to consider about the two constants is that the time constant, which is given by the product of the capacitance and the membrane resistance, is solely a property of the membrane. Whereas, as we've seen, the space constant is dependent on the radius, and thus it is a geometric property of the neuron. Anyway, it is good to keep these properties and constants in mind, as we will come back later to them when we will go over the mechanisms to increase the speed of conduction of the action potential and how the SOMA integrates many synaptic inputs. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in our next discussion.